we kick start the third day of the festival with what could be one of the most seminal talks of these three days we are proud privileged and happy to have with us dr vy viredi he is one individual who has made hyderabad proud as i said uh, the other day when we were you know uh, launching his uh, autobiography that he has a rock star status amongst uh, the citizens the thinkers the policy makers of this country the respect and the awe he generates amongst all of us is huge his word has more credibility than anyone else in matters of finance economy policy and in matters of public life uh he has often been very rightly referred to as the one who saved this country from huge debilitating consequences which happened world over in 2008 and around that time today he has decided to talk to us on a very interesting subject the title of which was coined by him and given to us gold white black and yellow dr reddy for you thank you so much sir for coming over thank you uh, thank you very much uh, okay yeah, many of the people uh, deal with gold uh, in personal capacity for my, my most of my dealing with gold has been in official capacity i'm not a goldsmith but still uh, uh it's funny when you it's quite funny when you deal with gold policy uh in the villages if somebody is sort of not is seeking some help and almost broke they'll go and tell well, you know family we have got gold 20 dollars 50 dollars valued so much and also value is indicated even government is like that when we had a problem in 1990 we had to show how much gold is available with the reserve bank of india and that is valued and in those days it was valued according to the value fixed in the act 1935 or something like that for a period the value of gold became 25 times in the world and 41 times in india so now how do you tell the world so therefore when we are in difficulties we have to pass an ordinance that was my first handling of gold pass an ordinance urgently to say no 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 don't worry the value of gold that we have in case we have difficulties is more than what you think it is so rbi and government are not much different from us in the village second now in fact there is a technical problem how do you value the rbi balance sheet is in rupees in rupees the value is 40 times but for foreigners they want to know how much is in dollars in dollars in those days it was only 22 times so therefore we arrived at a formula which said first we will take one month average value in dollar terms then convert it into rupees and show it in our balance sheet so that it's realistic anyway the ordinance was passed in those critical times that was my first interaction with gold second interaction with gold there is one person here just now i came to know who was involved in that process in 1990 yes right 1991 1991 that is gold it was leased we leased gold government of india leased gold to state bank of india because we were desperate and state bank of india had overnight uh, payments to be made they didn't have money rbi also gave money that was also gone nobody was prepared to give money to sbi and therefore they required something and so what do we do gold 
How did the government of India have gold? Can you guess? What was confiscated from smugglers? <laughs> so the smuggled gold, eh? most, most of it, so silver was, most of the gold was confiscated. Yeah, very little of the total smuggled. Oh, his point is, what government of India got was only a small part. Okay, that's true. So the confiscated gold came in very handy. The smugglers also helped our BOP crisis. Get over the BOP crisis. So then, but the question is, why did we lease the gold? We lease the gold because if you want to sell it, it's huge value, and the government of India procedures require so much, then everybody will know we are doing it. So leasing at manage, anyway, whatever the technicalities, we decided to lease, and one of those cases, so we said, the particular word we used, to enable them to sell and repurchase after six months. That's, so that is how the money was raised for six months, and that is how this gold, smuggled gold, all black money gold, came in very handy at the time of our crisis. And that was, I think, 19.65 metric tons. But we did not get back the whole, my, whole amount, as I'm sure you know. 18.36. Why? Our gold was not pure gold. So once it went to Switzerland, they had to clean it up, value it. And so when they did that, they found, like in all our jewels, about one and a half tons, <laughs> which was not gold, it part of the gold. So some of it was silver, some of it was platinum, whatever it is. Anyway, we got back 18.36 metric tons of gold, which was finally bought by the Reserve Bank of India. Generally, people deal with gold at the time of wedding. I also dealt with gold at the time of wedding, my daughter's wedding. I was here making arrangements for the wedding. Then I got a call, 7.30 at 8 in the night, come tomorrow morning, something has to be done. So that's how in May 1991, I traveled in the morning uh, with a special ticket brought in or whatever it is. That was to fix up the arrangements for pledging gold of Reserve Bank of India. So this was not enough. And we went in for money. Who? Bank of England and Bank of Japan. And IMF is a recognized body. Normally when a central bank pledges gold, you don't ask the gold to be transported. And this is why I'm giving gold, so you give me the money. And RBI is the depository of the International Monetary Fund. That means any world, any money, can be kept in the depository. Even then, they said, no, physically transport the gold. So physically, <coughs> we have to transport gold. Generally, people get throat problem after giving a speech. I'm getting it even before. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> that will shorten my speech. Uh, we had to send it, secret, very secretive. We tried to do all that. But, um, and it came out because there is a tire puncher. Yes, in the night, about 11.30 it was being transported, but it's not the tire puncher. Because the tire puncher there was a sound and all the vehicles which are guarding, the police fellows got out and took positions on the road. So all the people saw so many police people surrounding a van. Obviously there's something and then somebody <coughs> followed it to the airport, and there they found that it was being loaded into the aircraft. <coughs> Sorry. That was the next exposure to gold. So, <coughs> sorry. I think I'll take a small break. Sorry. What is this? No. So, that, that the gold also we brought back after six months. Not brought back physically, but we could pay up the money. We could pay up the money and that gold was also came back to RBI. Then comes, but interestingly why, 
why unusually they asked gold to be transported even when it was in the RBI. They simply because of politics and not economics in the ultimate analysis that matters. At that time, we had transition in government. Elections were underway. So they were not sure, even if the RBI pledges, new political establishment may disown that decision. And therefore, so that is how people always want to be sure that the independence of the Reserve Bank is guaranteed by the government of India. <laughs> that since the, since the effective government was not present, they wanted physical transportation. Now, after this experience, somebody said <coughs> that, look, what is this nonsense? Such little gold, 20 tons. We have got hundreds and thousands of tons in this country. The people are having gold. The government is not having gold. If the government has gold, we won't have a problem of next year. We can use this gold for foreign exchange. So a proposal was made by Reserve Bank of India to have a gold bank. The idea is that you take gold from the people of India, take it, take the foreign exchange, and whenever the people of India want gold, you get the gold, you can buy or sell, <coughs> so that this, there can be a stock available. This was proposed by Reserve Bank of India. A special officer was appointed. It came to the ministry. That was one of the very, very rare occasions. I disagreed with the Reserve Bank of India and I was working in the government. I said, no, it is not a desirable proposition. Reserve Bank of India as a central bank should not be involved in the business of buying and selling things. And in any case, it's not a viable proposition. So what were the explanations? And finally, the minister upheld my contention and Mr. Venkatraman never, uh, never uh, pardoned me for this defiance of the Reserve Bank of India. But I, to my recollection, is the only time I defied. But all through, we had a wrong policy on gold. <coughs> In 1947 to 1962, gold imports were controlled. Uh, I'll be a little slow. 62, uh, uh, 64, I think they passed the gold control order. So virtually 1947 to 62, whoever purchased gold in India, unless it is recycled, he was doing, he was buying smuggled gold. Naturally, it's black, very black. After 64, under gold control order, I don't think we are permitted to even buy or sell, or at least the dealers are not permitted to buy or sell 22 carat gold. So, but still gold was kept, huh? It was being smuggled, it was being sold, it was being purchased. So we had a policy, wrong policy obviously, up to 1990, from independence to 1990, from 1962 to 1964 to 1990, the largest and perhaps the major part of the black money in India was produced by gold industry. The commodity imported in reality after energy was gold, but that is not efficient. That was sold, imported, civilary trade was going on. That industry, the whole thing was black till 1990. From 1990 to 1997, all imports were, all except some NRIs of some time, that was again smuggled, black. But internally, domestic gold was not black in that sense because the gold control was removed. Mm. It was only in 1997 that the official import of gold through banks was permitted. So you know, often black money is more due to wrong law, wrong law or inoperative law than crime. Okay. Then, I joined the Reserve Bank of India, 1996 September, and then I had a really privilege of sitting, of sitting on Nizam's jewelry. Not literally, I was on the 18th floor, but that was in the basement. 
I think ja the, what Jacobs and Diamond also is part of the collection. And you know the story how it went there. In Zam's library, there was a court case. It's been taken over by the government. It was lying there. And when I was deputy governor, we had to, they, they wanted in Hyderabad. So it was brought to Hyderabad. <coughs> we had to make arrangements. It came. And after some time, they said, we can't afford. Because the insurance and the security was so expensive, it went back there. So I had the unique privilege of sitting for some time, taking it away, bringing it back, again sitting on it. That is what I did as far as Nizam's jewelry is concerned. But more important, 96 November or December, I thought it's enough is enough. And because I, I, till then, till it was 96. So we are discussing the whole question of capital account convertibility and how do you have a foreign exchange market. So the point was simple. You cannot say after oil, the second largest money we spend in reality is gold. That is unofficial. And where is the forex market? Where is the ex exchange market? Where is the exchange rate? So I argue that you can't do this unless you open up. Anyway, I gave a speech because in policy circles, everybody was afraid. So I exercised the independence of Reserve Bank of India to speak out the truth which I did, and anyway, the Capital Account Convertibility Committee, Hot water. the Capital Account Convertibility Committee, headed by Tarapur, recommended it. And so 1997, they, all the banks were permitted to, not all licensed banks were permitted to import. That is what I would call the first, uh, first, um, uh, public policy official say don't treat gold like an untouchable it is a reality and therefore you better open up you cannot have a forex market I was encouraged by the decision taken to liberalize the import of gold through the banking system licensed banks then I thought now we should go a little further and then what we did was in RBI I constituted a committee, a standing committee on gold and other precious metals with representatives of uh, Ministry of Customer, Consumer Affairs and Commerce. If that is a big commodity, if that is being imported, the consumer should be protected. If the consumer has to be protected from the shirts and trousers, they should also be protected from gold. So this committee tried to look at the gold market. It's, it's not just enough that... So I again gave a speech. So whenever I am uncertain about what I think, I give a speech, just like now. <laughs> so that we call the new gold policy. And I advocated the new gold policy. And uh, incidentally, you were in State Bank of India. I tried to encourage State Bank of India to start a gold exchange. And it is in Istanbul. I had gone and seen that also. But somehow SBI didn't, uh, uh, didn't show enthusiasm. My suspicion is the SBI did not show enthusiasm because the government did not bless it. Otherwise, normally when I suggest something, generally it is taken seriously. So anyway, that is off the record, okay. And now then, after three, four years, we found slowly, we encouraged assay. You, know, you, you had to refine it, assay it, hallmark it, encourage the Bureau of uh, Indian Standards to get into the whole issue. <laughs> And then we started recognizing the link between financial sector. The gold loans which had given Boy Syndicate Bank and uh, I think Canada Bank, they are specializing in Indian Bank. Now slowly it percolated. NBFC started coming. Then the links between financial sector and gold became evident. It was always there in the villages, but that was not recognized. See, generally, it takes a long time for all people in authority to see the reality. So in this case also, uh, it happened like that. Now, and I also, I visited World Gold Council in London. The World Gold Council is the, where you will get information. And first, when I visited, because where do you get information about smuggling? How do you get information? Smuggling, kaisa hota hai, kaisa hota hai. You know, smuggling, smuggled gold also is insured. There are insurance companies, unofficial insurance companies, <laughs> all that. So, in 1999, when we are doing this as far as the people are concerned, the central bank said, now the world, global economy, globalization, gold is old, useless, yellow material, metal, it has no, no value as currency. 
floating currencies. So there is no link of any currency with gold. So therefore gold became irrelevant. When gold became irrelevant, the central bank said, what do you do with the gold? So they started selling. When the leading central bank started selling, what happened to the price of gold? Well, then the central bankers met. It's called Washington Agreement. They said, look, look, we are going to lose money if we sell. So they cartelized. They sat together and said, every year we will not sell more than X amount of gold. We are not great gold holders, but I was a deputy governor at that time. So I said, informally, our standing, we never buy nor sell gold. So don't worry, we need to, there's no need to sign agreement, this is what it is. So they, they started selling for the next five years. Then the, renewal, the agreement was renewed, they are selling again for the next five years. So two, 1999 plus five, plus five became 2009. Then what happened? And then what did the central banks do? Buy. Buy. They started, stopped selling gold and started buying gold. The central bankers, big fellows, lot of brains. Huh? So they suddenly realized, oh, so that's what happened. So that is what gold is. It is the central banks who thought that gold does not matter, who deal with money, who deal with finance, who deal with gold, they are proved wrong in history. Then comes uh, the in between, let me give you a little more stories. The in September 2003, when I joined, I think again for us enthusiasm, there was big liberalisation of gold import by almost anybody was announced by the government. So then I had to tell the commerce ministry, no, liberalisation doesn't mean full liberalisation because gold is not a mere commodity; it has the characteristics of a currency. And it has a characteristic of a currency all over the world and in India also. Therefore, what is happening, how it is happening, where it is coming, should do have some hold, information. Therefore, it should be confined to banks. That liberalization going too much beyond. So therefore, uh, banks and some recognized it. So I had to roll back. Where I was always advocating liberalization. But when I became governor, the liberal in that one year I was in the fund, there is more too much of liberalization. So that's next step. So it's not only one direction. Reform sometimes has to be backward and forward also. And then similarly, one I always was frustrated by one thing. Whenever how much time do I have? Your time. Ten minutes. You see, whenever whenever there is a pressure on the exchange rate, they want to remove the government wants to remove the pressure on the exchange rate. So when they want to remove the pressure on the exchange rate, there is a gold, increase the duty on gold. See, our calculation in those days showed that whenever the duty exceeds about 4% of the value, it is becomes attractive for smugglers. You have to take cost of transportation, cost of insurance, profit margin, risk. Our calculation for gold is lowest. It's only about 4 to 4.5%. Four so whenever the duty is higher, then it becomes uneconomic. So what happens whenever you impose this, they, for some time there will be no transportation because official account stops because it's expensive. To bring back the arrangements of the non-official imports, it takes a little time. And then after that, it will come unofficially. So your BOP data will show. Imports reduce, ah, oh, our success, our policy is successful. <coughs> so I try to explain that this is not so. What you are, this reduction is not really happening. It happens for one month, two months. After that, the exchange rate pressure will not be relieved. But government, in its wisdom, has never listened to me. And even now that argument is not accepted. But that is very rational from the government's point of view. Why? Whenever there is a problem, government should appear to be doing something. Otherwise, it's, they think they are indifferent. So policy should not be indifferent, even if it is ineffective or counterproductive. So that is the problem. You must show that I am showing, even if there is adverse consequence. But I am not talking. So is it too bad? Not too bad. You can live with it because after some time. So this keeps happening. You see the history. Every time exchange it is under pressure, go back, go back, reduce it. 
we will find it reduced in the next few months, I expect. Now, there's something else. For me, there is a bit of a satisfaction that uh, in 1991, we had to borrow money from the IMF, as you know, BOP crisis. I was not directly dealing with IMF, but I had to be involved at some stage. 1991, as Joint Secretary Ministry of Finance, as uh, Executive Director of the IMF, the IMF recognized that our position is strong enough to be a lender. 1991, I was approaching the IMF as a borrower. And in 2002, I am sitting on the board and say that this country is strong enough to lend money to China. That's satisfactory. Not only that, I mean, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me or coal, but I mean, you, you always feel. It. But more important, we built reserves in the next five years. I, come, I came back in 2003, five years, and we built 320 billion from 70 or 80 billion. So, with the result, we had enough money for its reserves. So we bought gold from IMF. My successor, Governor Subarao, had the pleasure of buying gold from the IMF. But why did IMF sell gold? If everybody was purchasing gold, why did IMF sell gold? Can anybody guess? Any guess? When you sell gold? No, when you are broke. I'm not joking. IMF. So actually, the, the IMF, an institution which is supposed to maintain global financial system, monetary system, and ensure liquidity, all that. It's sort of a uh, global money system presiding. They didn't have enough money to pay salaries. Yes. They didn't have enough money up to because there are no borrowers. By 2006, <coughs> by 2006, so there's so much capital floating. Every country repays the money. Very few countries that was not enough to pay the salary. So what do we do? The people, the shareholders, have put gold with IMF. And unlike currencies, which give return, gold doesn't give return. So the the, the committee was called Andrew Crockett Andrew Crockett Committee was appointed. And they said, what do we do? Then they said, tell, told the members, please allow us to sell this gold, which is part of our share capital, create a trust, and that trust will invest this money. See, what are the interest in income? With that, I'll pay the salaries. So that's how the IMF survived in that period. And at that time, I remember the French finance minister said, here is an institution in such of a mission. And the Governor of Bank of England, I recall, saying that, or informally, he said, I think it is time we wind up this institute. It, just doesn't, it can't even maintain itself, wind it up. So then I told them, no, 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 don't wind it up. Why? I, because I had experience. Godavari Valley Authority, I must tell you this story. When I became Secretary of Planning, there was a Godavari Valley Authority, I was the chairman also, the office. I made a note, there is no need for Goda Valley Authority, planning, everything. When the Chief Secretary, he called me and he said, this is all right, but why was it created in the first instance? He said, sir, the Chief Minister wanted to get rid of a Chief Secretary. <laughs> so he created that authority, that's how it was created. Then he said, then why do you think that the situation will not arise again? Chief Minister wants to, want to get rid of me, therefore keep it. <laughs> And that's how it was kept. That's how it was kept. I, I was reminded of this. And I told them this story. And I said, look, it's easy to destroy institutions, wind up institutions. So if it doesn't cost too much, allow it. You never know the, whether the world will get into problem again. And we were, some of us were aware. So keep it. Even if it is ineffective, keep it. We should allow it. So that is how it was allowed. Though it was not able to keep for itself, it was broke, we had to pledge gold, it continued. And then immediately it became useful for the, at the time of the crisis and later to Europe. So what does it mean? The world authority, dealing with the, all central banks, dealing with all currencies, gold, 
When they were in difficulties, where did they go? Gold. That is the ultimate currency in the world, whether you will accept it or not. It's a useless yellow metal. There is nothing white or black. That is the only ultimate currency. That's the point I'm trying to make. Now, the uh, now let's wind it up with what has happened in 2015-16 last year. Something interesting happened. For the first time, there is some signal of a positive approach to gold in government of India. Earlier crisis born, they had three, they introduced three schemes. Gold coin scheme, a bank, a gold deposit for banks and gold bonds. Gold bonds doesn't work. It is not, I jokingly always said, as gold sovereign bond, I don't think it will work. But if it works, it is not in national interest. That's one. Second, gold deposit, I think any banker will know it doesn't make sense to get something for which you don't have corresponding buyer and it's not easy to match. But the gold coin scheme at least showed that there is a certain amount of seriousness about making it, making the market uh, a product uh, of like that. Some policy was not negative. Then we also found that uh, the gold um, uh, jewelers, they, are, they were asked to insist on pan, I think, about two lakhs or something like that. Some excise was levied, so that not so much money, but to track the goods. So I see a bit of what I may call um, uh, recognition about gold as a commodity or something which is in India and which is policy, public policy cannot ignore. These are signs of positive policy and therefore, and of course in the context of demonetization again it came back and again there was a little uh, disconcerting news for some ladies questioning, equating gold with black money. There may be some gold dealing with black money but now at least most of the gold is white money, some which is held by black. But earlier, the whole gold was black money. So let's not get into this equating. My point was, you should not equate gold with black money. Gold is something different. Gold globally is a currency. Domestically, it's part of our culture. For women, it is insurance. There is no property right. And it is, it is the ultimate um, safety. And uh, yes, it can slowly integrate. And you can see the trends already happening. The recent trends have shown first, unorganized industry is becoming organized. More organized developers now. Second, you will find in urban areas, they are having less studded jewelry. Uh, you know, jewelry is studded. More important, you will find that urban areas, the demand for gold coins has come up. Gold as an investment product. Gold as jewelry, gold as a consumption product continues. In. So this balance will keep changing. But the right thing to do, and that's what I want to conclude this day, that it is time we have a positive approach to policy for gold. There must be a positive, comprehensive gold policy. And I believe that it's so important for the economy. So many people are dependent for employment. But growth is being created in the market. So many are consumers, so many are producers. Quality is important. And from the linkage of financial sector is increasing. And therefore, it is time the government thinks of a white paper on a positive, comprehensive policy for gold. Thank you very much. Incidentally, I had the speeches which I have referred to, starting from 96, 97, 2002, and Gauhati, I gave a speech earlier this year. Uh, they are all on the website. I will give a paper. Baivireddy.com, my website uh, is available there. Thank you very much. You said we need to have a policy on gold. My question is, why can't we treat gold as any other commodity and leave it free of all policy? Very simple, it has the characteristic of currency. It has the characteristic of a currency. And therefore, we can. It has the characteristic. Otherwise, there is no need. But no, I won't say there is no need. Even then, for all products, including chicken products, or shirts, you have an option of standard, consumer products. So there are two elements of gold. If you accept gold as a commodity, whether for consumption or investment. Also it's a commodity both for consumption and investment. So 
if it is used for consumption, uh, customer pro consumer protection like any other product. If it is used for investment, then investment guidelines, protection, know your customer like any other product. So it is a com it competes with currency. Whenever the debasement of the currency happens, it takes the place of the currency. And currency and money is the function of power. So there are three things why, there are three reasons why. Gold has to be treated separately. Slightly separate. You don't treat health hazard in the same way as a commodity which is not a health hazard. So this is a sovereign hazard. Great answer. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Reddy. That was an enlightening talk this morning on gold.